خاطب الحور الحسان وطالبا لوصالهن بجنة الحيوان أسرع وحث السير جاهدك إنما مسراك هذا ساعة لزمان هي جنة طابت وطاب نعيمها فنعيمها باق وليس بفان وبناء Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd Continuing on in our treaties about the importance of the Islamic creed And as Muslims it's imperative that we learn our religion and as Muslims, it's incredibly important that we're on ilm wa fiqh wa basira, that we have knowledge, we have wisdom, and we have understanding of what Allah wants us to know and understand. Because that's, that's what creed is. Creed is actually, it is the belief, it is the firm belief in Allah and in His commandments and how to worship Him properly. It is, it's the belief in those things. If you don't have the belief, what are you going to have after that? There's nothing. Iman. This is what we are ordered with as believers. And so continuing on in our series about Iman, the Shaykh went on to say in his treatise, he began after talking about the pillars of Islam, the pillars of uh, or aspects of the first pillar of Iman, which is belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Tawheed, and Islamic monotheism, and Shirk, and you know, the opposite of, of that Tawheed, which is Shirk, which goes against monotheism, and talking about hypocrisy, and Kufr, and disbelief. The Shaykh went on to mention about belief, belief, and the pillars of Iman. And these pillars of Iman are brought to us, the six pillars of Iman are all contained in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, which we mentioned in uh, our earlier series. Where Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam about Islam. Then the next thing he asked about was Iman. And this was for bayan, this was making clear for us as believers to know what is Islam consist of? What do we need to know and what do we need to do? What does Iman consist of? What do we need to believe in? What are the pillars that we need to believe in? What do other things branch off from? The angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Ya Muhammad, he said, Akhbirni an al-Iman. He said, tell me about Iman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam responded by saying, And tu'mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa yawm al-akhir wa tu'mina biqadri khayrihi wa sharrihi. The Prophet ﷺ responded to the angel Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, Iman is to believe in Allah and to believe in His angels and to believe in His messengers and to believe in, to believe in His books, believe in His messengers and to believe in the divine destiny and the, the day of judgment, the good of uh, it and the evil of it. So, the Shaykh went on to mention from that hadith the second pillar, the belief in the angels. And this is belief in their existence and that they are dignified slaves. Allah created them to worship Him and to execute His commands. Allah the Almighty created them from light and for various kinds of tasks. From amongst them are those who carry the throne of Allah and those close to Allah. And from them there are those who are the guardians of the hellfire. And from them are the guardians of paradise. Amongst them are the angel Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam, who is responsible for the conveyance of revelation. Allah has given them the ability to change forms. And whoever disbelieves in their existence, then he is a disbeliever in, his, in Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And the one who denies the statements of Allah 
and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a disbeliever so anyone who disbelieves in the angels or one of the angels has disbelieved in islam is not a, dis, uh, a believer in islam so that's why it's important for us to know iman is complete the pillars of iman we have to believe in all the pillars if you disbelieve in one pillar of iman you've negated all of them it's not going to benefit you that you believe in Allah, but you don't believe in the messengers. It's not going to be benefit you that believe in Allah, you don't believe in his books. Or you believe in Allah, you don't believe in his angels. The next pillar that was mentioned is belief in the books. And belief in the books, it is the firm belief that they are real and that they are their truth. And that they are the speech of Allah, the majestic. And some of these books were mentioned to us in the Quran, like the, like the Quran, and the Torah, and the Gospel, and the Psalms of David. Some of them Allah did not mention to us. We believe in all of them. And the greatest of them is the Quran, as it abrogates and supersedes the other books. And it is the criterion to judge them. Therefore, it is compulsory, compulsory upon us to follow what came within them and the signs and legislation and that realize that the Quran and all the, met, all the uh, books of Allah were the divine speech of Allah. They were perfect and Allah spoke in reality and they are the revelations from Allah, the revelations of Allah. And they are not created because they are the speech of Allah. And it began from him and to him it will return. This contradicts the Shia. This contradicts those people who believe that the Quran is imperfect or that the Quran is ibara an kalam as the Ash'ari say. These people have very wicked beliefs. Do not believe that the Ash'aris mean good for you and that they believe what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam believe. They don't. They don't believe in the same belief about Allah, and they don't believe about the Qur'an, the same belief that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam articulated to us about the Qur'an, and the same message that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala sent with us about the Qur'an. Ahl Sunnah believes that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. It's divine and it's perfect. It's free from imperfections. And it is the real speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala articulates to us and said, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَقْلِيمًا That Allah spoke to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. We believe in that. And we don't change the meaning. And we don't change the i'rab, the 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 Arabic grammar of the, the verse, but rather we take it as it is. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Moses alayhi salatu wasalam. The next thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the, the next pillar which is contained there is the belief in the messengers alayhim afdal salatu wasalam. And it is the belief that the messengers and the acceptance of their prophethood and that they were truthful in what they conveyed from Allah and that they conveyed their messages that means they were complete in their conveying their message they didn't have shortcomings unlike some people claim some people actually have the nerve some more recent writers people like and I'll mention some of them like Sayyid Qutb like others who make uh, slander the messengers and believe that they were not complete in fulfilling their duty, that they were temperamental, like this. You never describe the, the, the messengers of Allah with something naqs, with something uh, as a form of weakness. No, they were the best of mankind. And they came with a, the, a perfect message from their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they made and clarified their messages to their people. And they clarified and fulfilled their duty that they were commanded with. And whosoever disbelieves in any one of them, then he has disbelieved in all of them. And whosoever disbelieves in them, then he has disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief in the specific messengers uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned by, the name, by name in the Quran is compulsory. And it is compulsory to believe in whosoever amongst the messengers was not mentioned in the Quran. 
The best of the messengers, alayhim afdal salatu was salam, uh, in superiority were Nuh and Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad alayhim afdal salatu was salam. And the most superior two of them, uh, the beloved Abraham alayhi salatu was salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the best of those two was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. May Allah send his peace and blessings upon all the messengers, all of his messengers. Alayhim afdal salatu wa salam, the best of mankind. Those people who delivered those perfect uh, messages. The message, they were the messengers of Allah. What is higher than that? And the then, then it moves, the shaykh moves on to the conditions for the testimony that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And he mentioned that there are seven conditions. He said first, number one, that he was a slave of Allah. He does not possess anything of lordship or worship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. Innukum mayyitum wa innukum mayyitum. ثُمَّ إِنَّكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ تَخْتَسِمُونَ وَكَمَا قَالَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى in the Qur'an, Allah mentions that I've just given the, the paraphrase of the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that verily you will die and verily they will die and what you differed about you know, the debates and the arguments the people debated with regards to these, minch, these issues of the bath, of the, the uh, day of judgment, will be settled on the day of judgment between you with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So knowing that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in reality, he died sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's with his Lord sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now. But, but he does not possess lordship. And he is not worthy of worship, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, verily he was the seal of the prophets, and there is no prophet after him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, that he must be loved in the completeness of that love uh, of him, is loving one, uh, is loving him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more than oneself, more than one's family, wealth, children, and all of humanity. Number three, or number four, is belief in what the Prophet ﷺ conveyed. Number four is obedience to what he ﷺ commanded to. And number five is to avoid things he ﷺ forbade and prevented. And prevented. Number six is that worshiping, or the last thing, is uh, that to worship in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Not to go beyond what he uh, legislated. Not to go beyond his sunnah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as, as we mentioned before in the hadith of Aisha, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ Whoever uh, does something which is not in accordance with this affair of ours will have it rejected. So we worship in accordance with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam How he did in his prophetic sunnah The shaykh went on to mention the status of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That the sunnah is revelation just like the Quran is revelation The sunnah expounds and explains the Quran Imam Baba Hari said A sunnah A sunnah to heal Islam Wa Islam huwa sunnah O kama qal he said that the sunnah is Islam and Islam is the sunnah. The sunnah expounds and explains the Qur'an. The sunnah makes clear what is implied or what is implicit in the Qur'an. For verily Allah the Almighty commands with prayer and praying the zakat or paying the zakat and other acts of worship. And the sunnah makes the details comprehensible. The sunnah also specifies what is general in the Qur'an. Allah has already mentioned prohibited eating dead animal meat uh, and things that are not slaughtered in blood. The sunnah makes exceptions, dead locusts and sea animals and from blood, spleen and liver. 
And the Sunnah expounds upon the Quran. So then Allah the, uh, prohibited the one from marrying the woman that suckled him, as she is considered to him a mother. And these things are expounded upon in the prophetic Sunnah. So the Sunnah expounds and gives details and makes clear the general ayats of the Quran. The Shaykh went on to mention the next pillar of Islam, which is Yom Al Qiyamah, the, das, the last day, belief in the day of judgment. And it is the day of judgment, and the meaning of it is to believe in everything that uh, everything that's going to take place on that great day, after death, from the punishment of the grave and the comfort of it, the resurrection after that, and the accounting of our deeds, and the weighing of our good and bad deeds, and the rewards and punishments, and paradise and hellfire, and everything that Allah has characterized the day of judgment with. And included is the believers will see their Lord. So this is what we believe as believers in the day of judgment. Some of the people of knowledge mention the signs of the last day in the, the chapter when mentioning the last day, because the day of judgment is preceded by signs that prove it will happen soon. Therefore, belief in it has not only become compulsory, but it is considered the very backbone of faith. As we mentioned, it's a pillar of Iman. It's a pillar of faith. The Sheikh went on to mention that paradise and hellfire are both existent now. They're existent creation. Paradise is the dwelling place for the obedient pious ones. And the hellfire is the dwelling place for the disbeliever and oppressive sinner. And they, paradise and hellfire, will remain existent absolutely forever. It is not permissible for anyone to claim that someone will go to paradise or to the fire except those who Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have declared are in the hellfire or in, the, uh, in paradise. So it's not permissible for us to say so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are in the hellfire. Even if we see them on disbelief or we believe that they're a righteous person, we don't know how they're going to meet their Lord because one of us will be an arm span length away from the paradise and what is written will overtake them and they will do the deeds of hellfire and enter it. And it, uh, likewise, the other, uh, the other way around, that one of us will be close to uh, being, in par uh, being in the hellfire and then what was written will overtake them and they will enter the, the paradise. This is from an authentic hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which should be, bring fear to our hearts as believers. Because we don't know how we're going to die. We're not like those people who say, I'm saved and that's it. I don't have to do deeds anymore. The believer has to worship Allah until death, until they meet death, because they don't know how they're going to meet their Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless us all with righteous endings. The next pillar of Iman that was discussed is the, is the belief in predestination and the divine decree. And it is Allah's decreeing of all things in existence and His knowledge of them before they came into being. And belief in predestination, it has four levels. Arba maratib. Iman has arba maratib. First, it is knowledge uh, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of everything completely. And that he has knowledge of all the minute details. And his knowledge of things before they came into existence. And from his knowledge is actions of the worshippers before they do them. The glorified subhana knows what was and what will be. And what didn't happen. And if it were to happen, how it would be. Also, the second uh, level is the writing, is the, and it is that Allah the Almighty wrote everything in Allah al mahfuz in the preserved tablet. The third thing is will, and what is meant by this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's comprehensive will for everything that occurs and his complete power and control over all things. And the fourth level is the creation, is that Allah is the sole creator for everything, and he founded it all. And that he is the only creator and there is nothing that was created except by him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Then the Shaykh went on to mention that there are categories of decrees. The complete decree, meaning everything that exists was written in a loh mahfuz. And the second is the age decree. And it is that the affairs of the fetus were written while it was in the stomach of its mother, such as its wealth, its work, its lifespan, and its sadness or its happiness. The third category is the yearly decree. And it is what is decreed during the night of power, meaning uh, Laylatul Qadr. And it is like what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, and He said, in it distinguishes every wise affair. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned regarding the daily decree. He said, Kullu yawman huwa fi shan. He said, every day He is engaged in some affair. And it is what He decreed from daily occurrences, such as life and death and giving honor and belittling. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and may Allah give honor to all the Muslims and help them in all of their affairs. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The next thing the Shaykh mentioned, he mentioned um, about uh, the d d divine decree and that it's an obligation upon all the Muslims to have certain beliefs regarding Al-Qadr regarding the divine decree. He said, number one, that what afflicts uh, a person would not miss him and that what mit missed him will not, was not meant to afflict him. That's very important for us to realize that. Everything happens by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree and do not feel sorrow for those things that which, which uh, you missed. Because in fact, you didn't miss them. They were what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed. Number two, it is not permissible to use the divine decree as an excuse to do a sinful act or leaving obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. For example, some people, they say they do sinful acts. Maybe they drink alcohol, they commit adultery, they steal something. And they say, oh, Qadr Allah, it was, it was the divine decree. I didn't have a choice in it. This is a false belief and this is a contradiction with the Islamic creed. You do have a, a free will. You do have a limited choice in your affairs. So you are held responsible for what you do. If you drink alcohol, it's a sin. You know it's a sin. And you will be punished by your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala before that. So don't use the qadr. Don't make it an excuse for doing sinful acts or leaving off uh, uh, doing salat. You can't say, qadr Allah wa ma I slept through salat. I, I, I don't have to pray. I'm not praying. You know, I'm busy. I'm watching TV. Qadr Allah. No. That's, it's never excusable. In fact, you're held responsible because the, the, that is abusing the Qadr. Because although, yes, it is the Qadr that you did not do that act, that's a part of the Qadr too. And you will be punished for that. You're held accountable for that. It, it's that you had the free will to do that and you chose to not to do that act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, which is incredibly important, it is not permissible to engage in deep conversation and contemplation of the qadr of Allah, of divine destiny. Because it's something we have little knowledge about. And because it is from the knowledge of the unseen, ilm al ghaib and Allah the Almighty only gave us limited knowledge about it. And He only gave the Prophet ﷺ limited knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, if the qadr, divine destiny, is mentioned, then keep silent. Meaning don't get involved in it because we, we only have limited knowledge and it will only lead to your maybe disbelieving or going into falsehood and philosophy like those people who've went astray. Then to dwell into divine decree results in several things. Number one, it can result in, in total denial of the Qadr and say, no, there is no the Qadr. As some of those extreme sects, the Qadriya, they went astray. They, divine, they negated the Qadr in totality. Secondly, it can lead a person to protesting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree, saying, oh, why me? Why did this happen to me? Why did my family member die? Why did this? Oh, Allah, why did you do this? Why did you decree this? A'udhu billah min dhalika. Stay away from that. Stay away from getting deep in the Qadr. Qadr Allah wa ma and leave it. Leave it at that and have iman in your heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. And he does everything for uh, his divine reason, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, confusion and nullification of sound faith. So the person who dwells into the Qadr a lot 
they can become confused in their iman. And it can actually negate their faith. Wa'iyadu billah min dhalika. The Shaykh went on to mention after that al ihsan which was also mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel, where the uh, Jibreel mentioned, he asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu what about ihsan? Prophet sallallahu said, it is in ta'budullah wa ka'annaka tara fa'innam tukun tarahu fa'innuhu yiraq. He said, it is to worship Allah as if you see him. And because you don't see him, know that he sees you. And this has two, uh, two different levels. Firstly, the level of, the witness, uh, of witnessing, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when, when the Prophet sallallahu said, Al-Ihsan is to worship Allah as he sees you. It is knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. So as if you witnessed him in front of you. This is what the shaykh meant by witness. The second level is observed, meaning that when the Prophet ﷺ said, so since you cannot see him, then know that he sees you. So it is knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala observes you, he sees you. The next chapter in the Shaykh's book mentions another important aspect of creed. And this is where we differ with groups like the Shia. All sects of Shia, we differ with in creed about them, but they have different levels. Ahl Sunnah has different levels. Ahl Bid'a, they have different levels. There are some, some people who have Bid'a to the extent they left the fold of Islam. There are some people who have Bid'a, غير مكفرة, which means that their Bid'a is, they're still in the fold of Islam, but they've went astray. They're away from the correct creed, or they're doing a practice of innovation, which is not mentioned in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and goes against the sunnah, but it does not take them out of the fold of Islam. So there are different levels of guidance and different levels of uh, misguidance. <laughs>